<laughs> Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name is Miriam. So this is future Miriam speaking before we get into the actual video because I have a couple of things to say before we get into it. First of all, if you have clicked on this video after seeing the length of it with the full intentions of watching the entire thing, I think that you deserve an award because this video is way too damn long. Secondly, this is in fact a spoilery reading vlog. I went into this reading vlog with the full intentions of making it non-spoilery. I attempt for like two seconds to make it non-spoilery, but then I quickly, quickly realized that there was absolutely no way that that was going to happen. So if you have not read Chain of Iron and obviously Chain of Gold as well, do not watch this video because I will be spoiling everything after about the nine minute mark. I'll put the actual timestamp where I start spoilers right here. But if you have not read Chain of Iron, do not watch past this timestamp. Now my third and final point is that what you are about to witness is very much unhinged behavior. Giving very much this energy for 50 minutes, yes. So prepare to see me very, very disheveled and theorizing. I went through some things while reading this, as you will see very soon. So with all that being said, Enjoy the video. You've read the title of this video. I'm assuming it is in the first couple of days of March. And this video is going to be my Chain of Iron reading vlog. Chain of Iron by Cassandra Clare. The sequel to Chain of Gold, which is probably one of my favorite books that I have read in the last couple of years. I actually just finished my reread of it last night. And this book, I seriously cannot describe it in words how much I love this book, how much I love these characters. It has touched my heart so much with just one book and we still have two more to go. But speaking of the second one, I got a package in the mail today. Here is the package. So this is the Chain of Iron ARC box. I'm getting it a couple weeks early um, and the story behind me getting this is that simply I shot my shot and I genuinely had no idea if I was actually going to get this until it came in the mail today. If I seem calm to you right now, it is only because it has been several hours since I unboxed this and I haven't fully processed that this has happened, but I feel like I am at least able to sit here and talk about it now. So here is the box. It opens. It actually came with this really, really cute embroidery kit that already has like a quote on it and the angelic rune. And then it came with these two Cordelia and James, I guess like paper dolls. These are absolutely beautiful. There is a quote on the box that says, you never forget your first betrayal. Not something that calms me down about this book at all, but here is the actual arc. And I literally still can't even process the fact that like my booktube channel has come to this point where I am able to receive a Cassandra Clare release. When I first started my booktube channel, first of all, I never thought that I would even get to this point of receiving any arcs at all. But I always would see like the really, really big booktubers get like really big release books like this as arcs. And I thought that that was just so cool. And I genuinely never thought that 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 would be me so like thank y'all for watching my videos and like allowing this to happen i guess i'm so grateful alhamdulillah but anyways i just wanted to record this experience of receiving this arc and record kind of my thoughts before i actually go into it first let's talk about what we actually know is going to happen in this book so we know that cordelia and james are going to get married no comment from me on that. We have no idea how that is going to work because James has Grace's bracelet on once again and he is under her control, under the control of both her and Belial and there's just a whole mess going on. So they're gonna be married, but also Matthew is in love with Cordelia and also Matthew and James are parabatai. 
So what the hell is going to happen there? I have no theories about what is even going to happen between the three of them because Cassandra Clare and her love triangles, we just never know. We honestly just never know, but it's going to be painful, whatever it is. I don't even know why I'm trying to talk about theories because literally this book is probably gonna go the exact opposite direction that I think it's gonna go. Let's not talk about theories actually because I have none, my brain is empty, but let's talk about what I hope happens in this book. I hope that damn bracelet is taken off of James wrist because I cannot deal with that shit anymore. It's stressing me out. It has stressed me out for a year now and I just want that bracelet gone. I want it burned at the state. I want it gone. Like I just want Cordelia and James to be able to both be themselves and to both confess to each other in this book. But I doubt that's gonna happen, but I'm still hoping for it regardless. I hope that Matthew gets a therapist. I hope that he starts dealing with his trauma in a healthy way. I hope that he stops drinking, starts drinking some water, and I hope that he finds himself on a happy path in this book. <laughs> Lastly, I hope that Alistair gets a redemption arc because I think that he deserves it but I hope that he at least works for his redemption. I'm going to start this book tonight on February 12th. I am starting Chain of Iron and this is my before and I'm very interested to see what my after will look like because I have anticipated this book more than most and Cassandra Clare just really knows how to tug at my heartstrings. Like I would say that Cassandra Clare is one of the only authors that is able to pull very, very intense emotions out of me while I'm reading. And since this is an arc and I don't really have anyone else to discuss it with, that just makes the experience of reading this even more daunting and scary. So yeah, I'm terrified but let's get into it. It is very, very early in the morning, but I'm on chapter four. Chapter four, <laughs> yes, I'm writing. And I hate it here. I very much hate it here. <laughs> I am reading an event happening, uh, maybe even a wedding. And there is someone at this wedding playing music and it's a very important person playing music at this wedding on a violin. <laughs> I don't think I'm strong enough for this. I don't think I'm built for this at all. I'm 83 pages in. I think I made a mistake. Y'all, I'm only 80 pages in. <laughs> no. I can't, I'm not built for this. I can't read this. I cannot read this. Hello. <laughs> it has been a couple of hours and I'm a little bit more level-headed. The last time I spoke to you, I was on page 88 and I very quickly set the book down after that and I have not picked it back up since. After a little bit of reflection, I think I'm actually going to make this vlog spoilery because I genuinely don't feel like I can talk about this book in a vague way because I am just already so emotional just this much into the book. I am already so emotional and I think that this would be a very very boring video if I just sat here and cried to the camera and didn't tell you what exactly I was crying about. So 80 pages into this book, I genuinely cannot function. Um, so let's discuss what has happened in these 80 pages. So we start out the book and we have that little prologue before chapter one where we see that there is someone in London, some kind of spirit or demon or something that has recently acquired a new form, a new body, and we see them murder someone and kind of ingest their life force as energy and sustenance to live. So I'm guessing that is going to be the main antagonist of the story. We don't know who it is. We only know that this being's enemies are James and Cordelia specifically. So who is this enemy? Is it Belial? We have no idea. I'm going to 
guess that it is Belial or it is someone that is working on his behalf. So then we go into chapter one and we quickly find out that James and Cordelia's wedding is tomorrow. It is literally tomorrow. I just was not expecting the wedding to even actually happen, if I'm honest. I thought that something was going to get in the way and postpone the wedding and it just wouldn't eventually happen at all. But no, when the story starts, Cordelia is like, wow, my wedding is tomorrow. And I was like, okay. So we see that Matthew has actually planned um, both the bachelors and the bachelorette parties for James and Cordelia. And both of those are kind of a fun time. We see both of them having fun, but they both do have a lot of nerves for this fake wedding that they are about to literally have. It's kind of setting in for both of them the implications of the literal life bond that they are about to mark on each other, literally, with runes. So then we have the actual wedding. That is obviously, as you can tell, what I was getting so emotional about because first of all, I didn't think it was gonna happen at all. I didn't think that we were actually going to have to see them commit to this and actually literally get married in front of their parents, in front of their friends, literally committing themselves to each other for life, but but as we know, it's really only going to be for a year. That was one of the most emotional things that Cassandra Clare has written. Jim playing the violin in the courtyard because he didn't feel as if he should actually come into the building. So he played the violin outside in the courtyard as Cordelia was walking down the aisle Cassandra Clare needs to go to jail for that. I'm so hurt. That shit hurts. Their actual wedding vows? Are you joking? I need you to be joking. James Morgan Henry Herondale. Hast thou gone among the streets of the city and the watchmen there and found the one thy soul loves? Cordelia heard Lucy catch her breath. She didn't release it until James responded in a firm, clear voice that echoed through the chapel. I have, he said, then seemed slightly startled as if surprised at the strength of his own conviction. And I will not let her go. <laughs> and then Cordelia has to say the exact same thing. She says, yes, and I will not let him go. And then they have some more vows and they exchange runes and they draw their runes on each other's skin. And then Charlotte tells them to kiss. Charlotte tells them to kiss and Cordelia, her inner monologue is like, oh shit, we completely forgot that we're gonna have to kiss each other in front of this entire room of people that thinks that we are in love. She thinks to herself, like she literally thinks, I can't do it, Cordelia thought, half panicking. She could not press an unwanted kiss upon James and certainly not in public, but he was already drawing her into his arms. His hands cupped her cheek, his lips brushing the corner of her mouth. We've come this far, he whispered. Don't back out on me now. She raised her chin, her lips grazing his. <laughs> he was smiling. I would never, she began indignantly, but he was already kissing her. So they kiss and I died and I set the book down and I haven't picked it back up since. My main concern, first of all, is what is going to happen with Cordelia and James next. They are literally married now. Like this is done, like they're married. They're going to have to move in together. They're going to have to sleep in the same bed. There was only one bed trope. They are married, they're married. But, oh God. But also I just, I cannot finish this book and know in my heart that I'm going to have to wait a whole year after this to get more of them. Like my, I literally feel like I cannot do it. Like I, I can't fathom it. Anyways, I am going to go and try to read some more. I will update 
the next time that I have thoughts on whatever's going on. Hello again, it is the next day and it is extremely early in the morning once again, so we're gonna use this microphone. Sorry about the audio change for a minute, but um, I don't wanna wake up my parents with my crying about what is happening in Chain of Iron. So I read from about page 88 to page 137 last night and I have some fucking thoughts about what is occurring. Okay, so basically where we last left off was when James and Cordelia got married. Okay, great, cool. We go through James and Cordelia's wedding reception and some stuff goes down with her dad getting drunk at the reception and they kind of have to like cover it up and make up for the situation and try to make people forget that it happened and we see Alistair and James actually removing Elias from the reception. It was really really heartbreaking to see Cordelia have to witness her father basically almost ruining her wedding because of him getting drunk. She thought that he was cured of his alcoholism, but as we can see, that is not the case at all, and it was extremely sad to see. So the wedding reception ends, and Cordelia asks James to take her home because they have a fucking house now. They have a home, not even a house. They have a home now of their own together. Cordelia is no longer Cordelia Carstairs. She is Cordelia Herondale. And people are calling her Cordelia Herondale. I just did not foresee this book going in this direction this early on. I have not even broken the 150 page mark. And Cordelia and James are fucking married. They're married. Okay. So James takes Cordelia to their new home, the new Herondale estate, and Cordelia has not seen this house yet that he bought because she let him handle all of the home buying and home decorating, and she just didn't really insert herself into the situation because it's obviously all fake and like, she just let him handle everything. But they pull up to the house, which coincidentally, not so coincidentally, is actually close to Matthew's house. They pull up to the house and it's actually like a four-story, beautiful home and Cordelia is in awe and she goes inside and it's perfectly decorated. There are bookshelves and there are Persian decorations on the walls and on the shelves that James purposely purchased to make her feel more at home. Are we kidding? Are we fucking joking? No, we're not apparently. So then we basically just get into them building their life together, their new life together for the next year as a married couple. And we get into like this two week montage of them and their new life and how they're adapting to it because obviously this is still a fake relationship but Cordelia is so in love with him and we see that James is just being the most kind and most gentle fake husband as he can because even though he still has a bracelet on and even though he is still like kind of being controlled by thoughts of grace he is still of mind enough to know that he is in this situation with Cordelia. They are in this together. They have no escape of this for the next year, so he plans on respecting her and being the best fake husband that he can be. And so we just see them like living life together and they have like this whole room situation where they have their own rooms, but they're connected by a bathroom. During these two weeks, they read together. Cordelia reads to James until he falls asleep and she has to wake him up so they can go to bed and they separate at their room doors and he gives her a kiss on the cheek, play chess together and they actually strike up this little game between the two of them where every single night they play a game of chess or a game of cards or a board game and whoever is the winner of the game gets to ask one question of the other. It's two weeks of this. We get like a two week montage of this and when I say I was losing my ever living mind, it was simultaneously so beautiful, but also so heartbreaking, but also 
why is everything so calm right now? Like, it literally was scaring me to turn every page and to see them living their life domestically because I know 100 pages into this book, I know that shit is about to absolutely hit the fan. I just didn't feel like I could really enjoy myself because for one, obviously this is still like an unrequited fake marriage and everything like that, but also on the other hand, what is going to happen to these two characters where Cassandra Clare would give me this little montage of them living happily 100 pages into the book. What is going to happen to them in the rest of this book? I don't know if I want to know. Honestly, I don't. So the next chapter is actually another Grace chapter. It says Grace 1896 and I guess we're gonna get more of Grace's backstory um, I can't say that her backstory is of much importance to me right now, but we're getting it anyway, and yeah. I have 520 pages to go, so like, pray for me. So Anna and Ariadne just had um, a little moment and i'm shocked surprised flabbergasted but not mad at it in the slightest okay so i forgot to mention earlier that grace actually did try to take off the bracelet from james's wrist the day of their wedding but that didn't work out like circumstances occurred she wasn't able to take off the bracelet um but it seems like she's genuinely trying to make an attempt to take it off like she's not trying very hard but she is trying when the opportunity arises to talk to James. So Cordelia and James were just at like somebody's engagement party and Cordelia from her point of view said that she saw James and Grace talking and James was like kind of getting angry and pulling away from her and so I don't know like we don't know what they were talking about but I'm guessing that she was trying to talk to him again to try to take off the bracelet. But like, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like the bracelet really needs to come off at some point in this book. But I just don't know how that's even going to happen because all of the opportunities to take it off are just kind of being interrupted or they just never work out. So we'll see what happens. Cortana just burned Cordelia for the first time. I'm not ready for this. Um, Lucy just told Jesse that she loves him. What the fuck is going on? Oh my god, okay. I'm gonna pretend like I don't have butterflies in my stomach right now. So we have James's point of view once again, finally. And he is talking about how he didn't even want to go to that party that they just went to, the engagement party and he's thinking about how he's like barely been leaving his and cordelia's house lately and how weird that is because usually he wouldn't stay home for that many days in a row and he would always drag himself out just to like go outside and not be in the house all the time and then he says staying at home with daisy he told her marriage would be a lark and meant it but he was enjoying it more than he'd imagined he would. He found he looked forward to seeing her at breakfast so as to tell her what he thought about during the night and at night to hear about what she thought about since breakfast. They saw their friends during the day, but he loved their evenings alone together when they matched their wits over games, made and lost bets, and talked about anything and everything. I'm going to pass away. So after he says all of that, he starts talking about a memory that he has where sometimes when his family was all together and they were spending time together in a room, um, his dad, Will, obviously, would get this look on his face that James would call the quiet look. And this look was when he would look over at Tessa, tracing every line of her as if he were memorizing her all over again, and then his children and a look of happiness that was sharp and gentle at the same time would come over his face. So he references that, right? And then he says, 
James knew now, though, what his father had been thinking when he got the quiet look. It was the same thought he had in the study at night, watching the light of the fire pass through Cordelia's unbound red hair, listening to her laugh, seeing the graceful movements of her hands in the warm lamplight. How do I live in this moment forever and not let it go? <laughs> I just almost knocked myself out with this book, but I'm... I need to get out of here. James learned Farsi for Cordelia. And he still has the bracelet on, but he's still doing these things for her, but he learned Farsi. <laughs> and he just spoke it to her parents, to her mom at the family dinner. He said he started learning as a wedding present to her. What would he be doing for her if he didn't have that damn bracelet on? I need to know because what? So it's currently 2 a.m. As you can see, I'm on my bedroom floor and things are rough. I have been reading a lot in the past couple of hours and I made it to page 281 and I didn't want to go any further without giving another update because I just feel like too much shit is happening and I feel like I just need to, I need to keep y'all up to date on the latest gossip. So don't remember what was happening in the last time that I updated, but I think that I failed to mention that throughout the entire story, we are getting point of view chapters from our main antagonist who is an anonymous serial killer that is killing shadow hunters specifically. We are getting chapters interspersed throughout the actual chapters that are in account of the murders that the serial killer is doing and we see from his point of view how he's feeling while he's murdering these people we are seeing that he's feeling hatred and he is taking their runes as he kills them which is very interesting um and i'm sure there are clues in these chapters as to who the killer is, but I'm not picking up on them because I have no idea who it is. After we see these chapters of the serial killer committing another kill, we go into the next chapter and we see that James is actually having dreams of these murders and he knows that they are happening before anyone else does because he is dreaming of them. But the catch is that he is dreaming of them from a first person point of view. And every time that he wakes up from these dreams, his wind window is open even if he didn't go to sleep with his window open so after a couple of these murders happen and the same thing happens every time he is starting to think now that he may be the murderer even if it doesn't make 100% sense he thinks that somehow he is definitely involved in these murders and the people that are being murdered are slowly like creeping up in the level of the people who are closest to our characters so the last person who was just murdered is none other than elias carstairs cordelia's father am i upset that he is gone much like alistair no, not really. The reason for that is not only because he has been a drunk ass this entire book, but right before he was actually murdered, he came over to Cordelia and James's home. He busted into their house and he started demanding money of James because he has debts to pay. It was actually a very, very intense scene, but it made me feel that much worse about Elias. I've been suspicious of him this entire book and I was starting to become suspicious that he was the serial killer, but um, obviously, it ain't him. So that's what's been going on. Um, other than that, Cordelia and James and their relationship continues to be so interesting and in how they're dealing with being married and they are slowly becoming more intimate with each other and James is slowly starting to fight back on the bracelet's powers and it is so interesting but so stressful and so infuriating because 
I just want this to be over with and I want them to get together and I want the bracelet gone and I want everything to be fine, but I'm kind of enjoying the slow burn. I can't lie. I'm enjoying the angst and I'm enjoying the journey to getting where we need to go with their relationship. Cassandra Clare is giving me everything. Like she's giving me all of the fan fiction-y type, like fake dating, fake marriage of convenience type tropes that I wanted explored in this book. And I just didn't think that I would get it, but I'm getting it. So yeah. Also another thing, Anna and Ariadne and their scenes in this book, um, I was blushing. And in the whispering room at that, I tell you, that whispering room has seen some things. Anyways, I just wanted to update all of that because I am starting to read a little bit faster and starting to get through it a, li a little bit faster. And so I just wanted to stay updated. So yeah. Good morning or bad morning, I should say because Grace just came over and James kissed her. And she said, and I quote, I do not know who you were kissing just now, James Herondale, but it certainly wasn't me. I don't know, maybe his fucking wife? Maybe, just maybe, that's who he was kissing in his head? Not sure, but that could be the case. Okay, so I am now on page 349 and nothing much is happening um, that has anything to do with this theory that I just concocted, but I just had a very, very bad thought. And I was trying to think about who the serial killer could be, um, like whose body is this demon possessing to do all of these murders and everything. And I have a crack theory that it might be Matthew. <laughs> like, it doesn't really make total sense to me right now, but I was thinking because it has to be someone that Elias knew. Because of that, it has to be someone like literally within our crew of people that we know and love. With the murders affecting James and with him seeing the murders happening through a first person point of view in his dreams, it could be something with the parabatai bond that is causing that. And just to add insult to injury, Matthew has been really, really secretive throughout this entire book until recently. Like him and Cordelia just went to like see Waylon the Smith and everything. And like, and they had like a heart to heart conversation and everything. So like he's not being shady or anything like that, but he has been keeping secrets from James. Like he moved out of his house and got an apartment and stuff like that so he's been kind of absent and i'm just scared i do not want it to be matthew please god anyone but matthew not anyone but i just hope it's not matthew what was that <laughs> i am now on page 438 i have this much of the story left don't want to talk about it but i'm kind of approaching a point in the story where i am getting into like that you know end of the story type of groove where you just are kind of like striving to finish so i don't know how much i'm gonna be updating unless like some really big shit happens in this last 150 pages or so which i don't doubt i don't doubt but i just wanted to do an update of some recent revelations because there have been a lot in the pages that i've read today so first of all this morning when i read the whole grace kissing james scene didn't love that one bit it's just been so interesting to see the very 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 snail pace slow development of James trying to break out of the bracelet spell and we learned that there's even like a crack starting to form in the bracelet. Another thing that happened was that we found out that Cortana was actually like 
basically sick because of when Cordelia stabbed Belial in Chain of Gold. His blood being on Cortana, being on such an angelic blade, basically just made it like stop working correctly, which I had guessed, like I had guessed that from the beginning that that's why Cortana was behaving the way it was. We found that out because Cordelia and Matthew went and sought out Wayland the Smith who made Cortana in the first place and it was actually such like an easy fix like he just like breathed on it and it like fixed itself which was very interesting but the catch was that he kind of coerced cordelia into swearing fealty to him and so she like promised to become his warrior basically and like to fight in his name. I don't think I'm not too worried about it even though it sounds kind of shady. I'm not too worried about it because like he he said that like King Arthur was like one of his people that had sworn fealty to him. So like I don't think it's gonna be bad. Maybe it's gonna be good actually, but I can definitely tell that that is going to affect something in the future. Like in, in some sort of battle, I might give her some advantage or something, but I don't know. We haven't seen anything like that yet. Also just a side note, but he was calling her Cordelia Herondale. And every time I see Cordelia Herondale, Wow, that has not sunken in yet. Cordelia and Matthew have a heart-to-heart -heart moment, which I mentioned briefly earlier, and Matthew tells her all about his backstory and what happened with his mom and the poison and everything. They had a really touching moment and they are starting to have a closer relationship because of that because she's literally the only person who knows anything about that like James doesn't even know. They are bonded a little bit closer since that moment and James is starting to notice which is very interesting. But another thing that happens is that we find out that James is not the serial killer. James is like super super paranoid that he is the serial killer so all of his friends tie him up and Cordelia stays by his bedside for a night to see what happens while he's sleeping and before they actually do that James tells Cordelia about his kiss with Grace he expects Cordelia to be mad because obviously he has broken her trust he has broken his agreement with her and he starts to tell her like you know if you want to leave me like that's fine like do what you need to do and she's like no i'm not mad but i want you to give me something in return and he was like what's that and she was like well i want you to kiss me because i'm gonna have to marry someone else one day and i want to know how to kiss and obviously as you can tell that was the previous clip i was reading that scene um, so they make out and Cordelia is on top of James while James is tied to the bed. I don't know how Cassandra Clare gets away with this, but I'm not going to question it because thank you. So yeah, James is not the serial killer. Matthew's not the serial killer. They find out that the killer is someone who should be dead and someone who had a wife that cried over him being dead. So we don't know at this point in time what is going on. We also just found out that Edom, the infamous Edom from every single Shadowhunter series is also gonna be a part of this series. So that's just great. Definitely not sick of that place. Definitely not. Lastly, I just wanna say that Lucy is kind of scaring me with the whole Jesse thing and the necromancy thing and working with Malcolm Fade because from what I know right now, it seems like Lucy and Grace, but kind of more Lucy, is the reason that we have the dark artifices in the first place. Don't love that for her, but um, yeah. So I'm gonna keep reading. I don't anticipate that I'll actually finish today. Um, I'll probably get very close to finishing and then like finish it out tomorrow morning. I don't know, genuinely have no idea how this book is gonna end. I will see you when I see you. Now wait a fucking minute. It might be Matthew. Oh my god. Matthew, please. <laughs> please. Page 492 and 493.
and probably 494. Wait. The bracelet fell off. Bro, fucking Lilith. Are we kidding? I finished. So it's been a couple of hours and I feel like maybe, maybe, just maybe, I can talk about my feelings on this book. I have never had the absolute displeasure of having my heart literally ripped into pieces like this since I read maybe Clockwork Prince. It's not Clockwork Princess levels. Clockwork Princess epilogue levels. It's not that. It has the absolute potential to turn into that, but it's not at that level just yet. I kind of have to make this quick because my phone is on 10% and I do not have electricity right now. I'm living through a winter storm right now. I've not had electricity in almost 24 hours. This situation is already not great and it's even more not great because of this book, but we'll get there. So if you're at this point in the video, I assume that you already have read the book and you already know exactly why I'm having the reaction that I'm having, but let's go ahead and recap, shall we? So it turns out that it was in fact Belial who was behind all of the serial killings. He was possessing Jesse Blackthorne's body during the daytime without Jesse knowing about it. So we have that, we have that revelation. It wasn't Matthew, it wasn't James, it wasn't anybody in the crew, thank God. It was in fact Belial. And so that's that. Then we also find out that it was not Wayland the Smith that Cordelia swore fealty to. It was Lilith who had a whole plan. She's been working on this plan throughout the entire book. She masqueraded as many people in order to get Cordelia to become her paladin. She masqueraded as like a fairy. She masqueraded as Magnus Bane, Waylon the Smith, so many people in order to get Cordelia to become her warrior. Cordelia is the bearer of Cortana, which is basically the only weapon ever that can kill Belial. And Lilith wants to kill Belial because he stole her realm. The third thing I want to discuss is how Lucy has literally gone mad. She has gone absolutely insane with the thoughts of bringing Jesse Blackthorne back to life. She is going all in on this necromancy thing. She is basically the reason why literally the dark artifices exist. And this book and this series is definitely going in the direction of setting up for basically everything that happened in the dark artifices. The dark artifices plot happened and is a thing because of this book. Uh, so thanks for that, I guess. Lucy was definitely getting on my fucking nerves as this book went on because she was just getting to the point in her journey to bring Jesse back that she was starting to neglect her family, neglect her best friends, neglect her future parabatai. She started to not give a fuck about anything else but bringing Jesse back. And that was just really starting to scare me and creep me out because I love Lucy, but girl, it's too fucking much. Like, let it go. Let this man go in peace. But she will not rest. She wants him back to life. And in the end, she does in fact bring him back to life, but we don't know at what cost. To be honest with you, I'm exhausted. I don't know if I want to know at what cost she brought him back to life for, but we're gonna find out in a year, which is another thing. I can't wait and I cannot wait another year. Like, okay, let's keep going. The last two chapters of this book, we know what happens. James and Cordelia are finally having a moment alone together after the bracelet falls off of James's wrist because immediately after it fell off, he like 
collapsed and a lot of stuff happened. The final battle happened and James and Cordelia did not have a chance to discuss the bracelet at all after it fell off. So we get to this moment in the last two chapters where they're finally together. They're talking and everything. They kiss and it's very beautiful. And Cordelia pulls away because she knows that if she just lets herself go down this road, like she's going to keep believing that it's a real marriage and that it could be real someday when the situation is in fact like it's not and he loves Grace. At least she thinks he does. So James, my poor boy James, like he does not know how to properly communicate. But Cordelia says something to the effect of you do not feel the same about me as you do about Grace and you never have. And he's like, yeah, you're right. Like I, I've never felt the way about you that I have about Grace. And obviously when he says that he means it in the way that he has a hatred and a disdain for Grace now after the bracelet fell off and that he loves Cordelia and could never love Grace the same. But obviously, obviously Cordelia does not take it this way because he does not make this clear whatsoever. So when he's about to explain to her what he means, the doorbell rings. He tells her to go wait in the room and he goes downstairs and answers the door and it's Grace. And obviously he's angry. He wants to get the explanation out of Grace why she has been deceiving him for all of these years why she has taken so much of his life and so much of his control all of these years. And so he plays along and lets her inside and Cordelia sees them together and misconstrues the entire situation and she runs and she goes to Matthew's. <laughs> Matthew confesses to her and all Cordelia can think is like, wow, so someone does love me. And Matthew proposes that they go to Paris together and she accepts. Meanwhile, on the other hand, we have James and Grace having the conversation. She's explaining to him the entire situation with the bracelet and everything. He is chewing her the fuck out. Like he is letting it all out. He is so angry. And there's actually this paragraph that I wanna read because it just hit me so hard when he was talking to Grace. So he says, I remembered how when you took the bracelet off me four months ago, I felt as though a fog had been lifted from my brain. I could think again. I've only been half alive since I was 14. You have not just made me think that I loved you. You have subsumed my will over and over until I no longer know who I am. Do you even understand what it is that you've done? Why has Cassandra Clare done me like this? So after that, James locks Grace in the room that they were in. He calls for someone to call like the shadow hunters to come and arrest her for what she's done. And he asks, where's Cordelia? And his maid tells him that she fucking dipped. So he's running through the streets of London looking for Cordelia. He does a tracking spell. He finds out that she's at Matthew's house. He calls up Matthew's apartment and asks the attendant if Matthew is in. And the attendant tells him that he and a woman just left to the train station. He rushes to the train station. He buys a ticket to Paris. He sees Matthew and Cordelia get on a train and he's running towards them and Will comes out of nowhere and tells him that they need to go save Lucy. So he lets Matthew and Cordelia go because he trusts Matthew to keep her safe. And the book ends. I am hurt. I am consumed by the pain that I feel for these characters and the heartbreak that I feel for everyone involved. Cassandra Clare puts her characters through so much, too much, too much one could say. The mere thought that I'm going to have to wait an entire year to read the next and the final book, to have to wait to see what happens after this and then for the entire series to just conclude, I am beside myself. Everything is pain. I know nothing but pain. Like I, I don't know what else to say, y'all. I don't know what else to say. I'm hurting. 
I am hurting so badly. And it's not even just James and Cordelia that like, I mean, they're the most important thing in the series to me. Everything that they have gone through pains me so much. And I should have known, I mean, I did know at the beginning of this book when they were getting married and they were living domestically, I knew that shit was about to hit the fan, but I never could have expected to be this bad. Anyways, I think I've said everything else. I mean, I love Anna and Ariadne. I love Thomas and Alistair. I don't really love Lucy and Jesse. I think that she needs to let that man go, but that's just me. I love James and Cordelia and Matthew. I really do hope that Cordelia and Matthew have a good time in Paris, but damn, like, this is just not it. Like, I cannot, I, it's a five-star book, but at what cost? So that was Chain of Iron. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below if you have also read Chain of Iron, which I hope you have if you're still watching. I have no one to talk to about this right now. I have to wait at least a week to talk to someone about this. And yeah, I'm gonna go back to bed because my house is 50 degrees right now and I'm very cold. So leave any and all thoughts in the comments and let's have a discussion. Hope you're well, hope you're better than I am right now and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.